I'm Liz Davey, and thank you for joining me today for a walk in the garden. This is a show in my garden and in my kitchen that is filmed in my Norfolk garden by NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television. We're going to start in the herb garden, as we usually do in this series. And uh, I've already cleaned off most of the leaves, some have blown back, but we're busy cleaning up and we finally got a few nice days. I don't know if it's going to stay, but we have spring for two days at least. Uh, it is April, early April, so we don't know how the weather's going to go for the rest of April. March was not such a good month in the garden. Uh, we had snow for most of it, but the snow has melted and it's time to start cleaning up and pruning down. In the herb garden, I have sorrel that's coming up nicely and uh, also some onions, top onions. Those are a perennial type of onion which will form little sets on the top when it blooms. Rhubarb is starting to poke up. There's one rhubarb there. And of course chives back here. And we'll have chives ready to eat if this nice weather continues and we get a little uh, warm rain instead of cold rain and snow. We should be able to have chives in another couple weeks. Uh, other things are just starting to pop up. We have some garlic chives and uh, the roses are just kind of uh, not yet leafed out. It hasn't been warm enough. Usually I say to prune roses about now, but this rose only blooms once a year. So I won't prune this until after it's finished blooming. That's an exception to the rule. If you have roses that are that rebloom continually, then you can prune them now. But if they only bloom once a year, if you prune them now, you're liable to cut off all the blooms. So wait until after they bloom. You can always cut off any dead pieces or broken pieces. If you have some broken pieces or obviously dead ends, you can cut those off now. But one of the things you can prune back would be thymes. And the thyme is a perennial herb. And I kind of clean out some of the leaves by hand. And you can see that there's some green growth on it. A lot of these things I'll prune back when I see that it's starting to grow. And again, the thymes, I'll take these back fairly low. And this will encourage them to send out some new growth. I have a lot of different kinds of thyme. English thyme, lemon thyme, caraway thyme are just a few. They're all different varieties. Each of them has a little different flavor and they can add a lot in the kitchen to different dishes. Lemon thyme is one of my favorite. In fact, lemon herbs of any sort are a favorite with me. I'll be buying some of the annual herbs as time goes on. But I'll just trim back this one as I go. Sometimes a pair of scissors actually work even better than your garden clippers on some of these with very fine leaves. But we'll go around and take these down a bit and then we can get in and get a few more of the leaves and other debris out of them. I won't mulch just yet either in the herb garden or in the perennial garden because it has been so cold. I'd like the ground to warm up a little bit so things can really get going before I cover it with mulch. Also, we hope to get some spring rain. Another thing you can look for will be some things that reseeded from last year. I have uh, several things that might reseed, including some dill and also the uh, this, this one which is Hmm. mint and it will spread around and there's there's just a number of them that can reseed in the garden. Parsley occasionally will come back. I think I left one of the parsleys up here and here it is. It's going to come back this year. Parsley is a biennial meaning uh, it grows one year goes and then the next year it comes up again and goes to seed. So if you have parsley you don't take it out after the first year because you'll get an early spring crop of parsley. However then it goes to seed so plant another one and then you can keep it going for several years in advance. This is the southern wood and the southern wood can be trimmed back. Well, you'll see a little indications on the stems themselves that it's ready to grow 
and it gets kind of gangly and tall if you don't trim it back each year. So I'll be trimming that back to probably about six inches tall and then just composting what's left. The same with rue, which is this one. And again, taking off any dead shoots or just heading it back a bit as we see it start to grow. Lavender is another plant. I have some here in the herb garden and also in the perennial garden. And I've removed any covers I had on it. And again, I'm gonna wait a little while to make sure I see some nice new growth on this. What we're seeing now is the old growth and I don't want that to continue. The oregano is coming up, tarragon's coming up. Everything's starting and when we get those nice warm days, when we've had a really cool spring, sometimes it just goes to summer all at once. So things are uh, very condensed for working in the garden. The, as much as you can do early, the better. This is uh, sage. Now, last year, with a mild, milder season, my sage actually held on to a lot of its growth. This year, I don't think it's gonna be so much. Again, I'll wait until I see it start to sprout from the base, and then I'll cut it back. Maybe in a couple weeks, we can do that. So let's move on to the perennial garden over this way. I'm standing on the lawn right now, forsythia, was kind of stopped in its tracks by the last snow and cold. Uh, it was ready to bloom and now it's ready to bloom again, st or still ready to bloom. Once the forsythia, and that's that yellow stuff that's all over, it's a shrub that many, many people have, but once that's in bloom, it's, it's an indicator plant, and that's the time that you wanna add your pre-emergent weed killer on lawns, and that can include the corn gluten products, the organic ones. They only work if you add them at the right time. And when the forsythia is in bloom is the right time. So if you're going to use that type of product on your lawn, be aware of when the forsythia is in bloom so that you can add it and use it. Also time for spring fertilizer and some raking and dethatching of the lawns and general cleanup this year since we've had so many branches down. Working into the uh, perennial garden. I have gotten it cleaned off and uh, checked to see what's coming up. Some of the things were under straw and the straw has been removed for the most part and our spring bulbs are starting to make good progress. The daffodils are just about ready to pop out all over and some hyacinths. Tulips also are growing. Some of them have been nibbled by the deer and I've been using deer spray, but I think it's time to change the brand. Sometimes you have to change the brand to discourage them. So some of them are not as uh, good as they could be because of the deer. So I do need to change the brand of deer spray every once in a while, it's a good reminder. It is time to plant new perennials in the garden and I'm gonna to plant uh, today, a, I ordered some plants uh, via mail order, and one of them was a clematis to climb up this pole, a new one. I had lost one in this position a few years ago when we had a drought. So I did get a new one, and this is going to be a red one. The one that was here before was purple. And I've dug a hole, and we'll continue digging out a little. And I want to amend some of the soil in here, make sure it has a really good start. So I've dug a fairly deep hole. It's probably 12 to 15 inches deep. And I'm going to add some uh, lime, or, I'm sorry, not lime, some bone meal. Lime comes in a similar bag. And we have to open. And I want to add the equivalent of a couple handfuls of bone meal into the bottom. Then I'm gonna just mix that around down in the bottom of the hole. And then I'm gonna layer some compost on top of that, which I've taken from my compost pile. And then I will add my lovely little plant. One of the things you need to do with the clematis is to plant it fairly deep. 
This ensures that uh, there is some peat here, which we would like to continue to add to it. And I'll just put the peat right into the hole and mix it in with the compost and the soil. And this is the little plant, and this is where it will come up. And these are the roots. It has a lot of roots and not much top. And I want to bury that top at this point and spread out the roots inside the hole. You probably can't see it, but I am spreading them out so that this will be three or four inches under the surface. And I'll make a little mound in here to kind of spread the roots out on. If any of the roots were dry or looked dead, they actually look pretty good, I could cut those roots off. And the idea is to have it fairly near enough to the post when it comes up that it will be able to climb right up. Then I'm going to start adding some of the dirt that I took out of the hole. And I'll add a little of the compost. Let's use a cup here and mix it in. Mix it around as we go. I want to pack it fairly tight, but I will be watering it in. And then we'll just continue to fill it. If I find any nice big rocks, I will not put those in. And again, the uh, top of it is going to be a bit lower. It's not at the surface. Some plants you plant at the same uh, depth that they were growing. This one we want a little deeper. In case something happens, like something snips it off, if the roots are down under and the spot where the stalk comes out is buried, it'll have a chance to put up multiple stalks. And if it gets cut off, it can then come up again. Continue to press down the soil. And then I want to water it well. We are uh, predicted to have some rain this evening. I don't think too much, but enough that it will settle in. So I want to water it in good anyway. This gets the air pockets out, which you don't want around the roots. And I may need to add a little more soil after we're finished with this. I did buy a second one, which I will put uh, on a pillar over further in the garden, a pink one. And I'll do the same thing, uh, the same process to plant it. Again, this rose is not ready to be pruned. Uh, I will wait until some of the little new foliage starts peeking out. Usually about the time the Red Sox come back to Fenway is the time to prune the roses. This year it doesn't work that way, and I think the people who went to Fenway for the first few games would probably agree. It's a little too early. I do have my deer spray ready here. Again, I'll hit the tulips and consider a change of deer spray as we go. Deer spray are uh, tulips dessert. However, things like Sedum Autumn Joy, which I've cut the old stalks down now, are one of the main courses. So I will also give that a spray. You'll get to know which of the plants the deer will consume, and also the rabbits, and then you'll know which things to spray. I can guide you a little bit on that, but not entirely. I have a couple of rhubarb plants over here, and I'm going to add some all-purpose organic fertilizer around the edges of these. Rhubarb is a uh, rather strong feeder. I don't always fertilize everything in the garden because it really doesn't need it if you have good soil. But rhubarb tends to really 
have a big appetite for nutrients. So I'll put some around the outside of the rhubarb. I don't want to put it on the plant itself, but around the outside. The same thing is true of peony plants. And the peonies are starting to show the red shoots. One thing about peonies is that they can't be planted too deep. The crown of the plant, where the stalks come out, needs to be only half inch to an inch below the level of the ground. And if it gets buried deeper, for instance, you start piling mulch all over it every year, the peony will refuse to bloom. It'll probably come up and make foliage, but you won't have any flowers. So you want to make sure not to load it with mulch. Again, it needs a little extra in the area of feeding, and I'll put it around the outside, or what they call the drip line on the plant, where the leaves would drip if it rained on them. Peonies can also be subject to a couple diseases. One of them is a black spot disease, botrytis, and also mildew. And to try to get ahead of it and combat it, I'm using an organic fungicide called Serenade, which I've mixed up in my spray bottle. And I'll just spray that on the shoots as they come up. And I'll repeat this every couple weeks as the peonies come up, and hopefully that will eliminate that problem from the peony foliage. As we go along, we have other spring bulbs coming up in this area, and aliums. Uh, you'll notice the daffodils and aliums are not bothered in the least by any critters. They don't like them, so they're a good plant to plant. Daffodils are one of the easiest bulbs if you have a nice sunny location. It's time to start taking baskets off. I've done most of them. Remember we covered the lavenders with oak leaves last fall. Now it's time to take them off. You'll notice where it was covered, this uh, daisy has accelerated growth. Don't worry if it frosts, these will still be fine. They just need a little extra protection when it gets really cold. They'll make it down to about 20 degrees just fine, or even less. But this just gave it a little extra protection and maybe a little earlier start. We have a fine dandelion that we will discourage and dig up. I can add these leaves to my compost or discard them. I'll probably add them to the compost. It's convenient just to put them back in the basket. And again, this will be pruned down as soon as we see the fact that it's going to make some new growth. And the rock again can go away. One of the things I'll do with the peony, or the clematis, once it comes up, is put a rock in front of it. Having a rock in front of the clematis will pick up extra heat as the, it absorbs heat from the sun, and that seems to help it. It also shades the roots, and the clematis likes its head in the sun and its feet in the shade. So putting a rock by it does help with that. However, right now, since it was just planted, and I can't exactly see where the shoot's going to come up. I will leave it alone until we see it emerge. The poppies are up. This put on fall foliage, and now it has spring foliage, and we'll have oriental poppies in June. This winter, I bought a few plants just to have some color inside. When Every time it snowed, I felt I needed a little color. This one is a primrose, and it will serve double duty. Not only did I, I enjoy it inside this winter, but I can plant it out here now, right in the garden, and it will return next year. So it's a good one to get for a little winter house plant, and then enjoy it when it comes up again. It still has one bloom on it, but it does like it a little cooler, and the house is getting a little warm for it. So it was time to get it outside and add it to the garden. Now it's time to go into the vegetable garden and do some planting there. It's not too early for that. 
Our winter seeding plants are right here in the milk jugs. This is where they've been all winter of, well, since January, February when they were planted. And I'm happy to say that the kale and the Brussels sprouts are already starting to show growth. Most of the others are not, but I'm hopeful that they will as the weather warms up. They usually do. If we get some really warm weather, I'll be able to undo these tapes and open the lid on these containers so that they can get full sun. And when they've reached sufficient size, the things can be transplanted either as perennials or vegetables into the appropriate gardens. There is another clematis on this post, and this is what they call type two. Pruning of clematis confuses a lot of people. Uh, they really don't know how to prune it, and the type ones, you never prune at all. They're, they're the easiest, but they also don't grow that well here. Uh, type three, you prune all the way down to the bottom. Type two is the confusing one, and they're the ones that grow really well for me. And what you basically do is look for new growth, and I see some right here, and you prune back to the new growth. There's some here as well, and any broken stems you take off, and any of the other stems, side stems, that aren't producing any growth, you can take those off too. And every few years, I will cut this back even lower until I find some growth down in here. I'm gonna leave this one high, and it will hopefully spread out a little bit and cover this arch. But there is new growth down in this area, and I can take off some of the pieces. They aren't really too hard, and if you prune a group two, just like this one, as a group three, which means you take it all the way down to here, it really doesn't matter. It will come back, and Sometimes if it gets too bushy, that's the best thing to do. Just take it all the way back and start over. But this is one of the, uh, as I said, confusing things about it. But they do have lovely big flowers and bloom throughout the late spring, early summer and add a lot to a trellis. You can also grow things with them. Many times you can grow them with a rose or into a shrub and actually get two different types of blooms on the same area. Now I'm gonna do some planting in the garden. You'll notice I have a row here with the garlic coming up. We planted that in October, and it's coming up through the mulch, and I'll just leave it alone and let it do its thing. It really doesn't need anything done, except perhaps to spread a little of that all-purpose organic fertilizer around it to help feed it. But I've made a couple furrows. I've put out strings and stakes, measured out some rows, some people uh, plant things in thicker groups. I kind of like to plant in traditional rows. It's what I grew up with and just seems familiar. Although some things I do put in little groups, like my squash or hills. But I'm planting today spinach. And it's important to get that in as early as possible soon as the ground can be worked, most directions say. And I plant it, plant it rather thickly. And I'm gonna cover it with about a half an inch of soil. This likes cool weather. And if the weather gets hot too fast, the spinach just goes to seed. And you never get any of those lovely leaves. This is a different variety to me called Oceanside, and it's supposed to stand pretty well into the heated weather. And I'm just gonna keep planting it down. And I plant it rather thickly. Germination isn't always great. Once I've planted a row, I'll pull the strings off and move on to the next row. And as the weather warms up, we can just keep planting things. I'm going to go all the way down to the stake with spinach and hope for a good crop this year. The fact that it's been so cool, if it stays this way, we may just have good spinach. 
in our climate, it's always a bit of a guessing game because sometimes, as I said before, you'll have very cold weather in the spring and then it gets very, very hot very, very fast and that's not good for the spinach. And you find my rock. It's a little windy today, so a nice rock helps hold the packets down. The other thing that you can plant early would be a few radishes. And I certainly don't want to plant a whole huge row of radishes because we don't use that many. And it would be overkill to plant the whole row of them. But I do want some. And I want them not to all come at once. So I'll just plant a few at a time. And then in another two weeks, I'll plant a few more. That way it'll hopefully spread out the harvest a little bit. And we won't have to eat radishes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So we'll just plant a couple feet. You can do this with lettuce as well, so that you don't have a huge crop of lettuce and then nothing. You want to spread it out a little bit. The other early seeds I can plant are peas. And I'm gonna start out, I'm gonna plant ultimately three different kinds of peas. And the first ones I'm going to plant are uh, snow peas. These are Oregon giant snow peas. And I'm using a seed inoculant, which is a nitrogen fixing bacteria, which will help the peas fix nitrogen. And it does encourage their growth really well. It's used on different types of peas and beans. And I've dug a little deeper trench for these. And I'll plant the peas an inch or two apart. And again, I have several other varieties to plant. I will be planting snow peas, which you eat the pods, and also some snap peas. These are the um, snow peas, but you eat the pods. The snap peas, you eat pod and more developed peas. And then shell peas, where you would shell them out. A little more labor intensive, but they are tasty. So we'll end this row about here. And again, we cover the seeds with about three times their depth, or maybe even a little more, and pat it down. And I'll use a rock to mark my spot where I stopped planting. And I can come out with my other varieties and get those in too. Thicken these up a little. In the next couple of weeks, as these start to poke through with new growth, I'll need to add some supports so that they can climb. It's important to move these around the garden from year to year and not plant them in the same place where you've had peas for three years. This helps discourage any diseases. That's true of most of the vegetables. You want to try to move them around a little bit. With a small garden, it's sometimes hard to find different places to put things. But this is a, a good rule of thumb. If you can rotate your crops a little bit, it's much better for them. The next thing I need to plant are the strawberries that came. Again, I ordered these. We had some strawberry plants last year, but they were getting to the end of their life. And so I bought new ones. And I have them sitting in a little water because you don't want them to dry out. And you'll notice they have some pretty good roots. And I'm going to plant these in a double row kind of alternating plants. And I'll dig down and put the plant in. And it's important with strawberries to get those planted at the same depth that they were when you received them. No burying these or having the crown stick out. 
you have to be fairly particular about where they are. And again, I'll do one there, then one here. Until I've filled my row. And again, take care with each one that it's at the proper depth. And then I'll move over here. These will throw out runners and fill this row by the end of the year. At least that's the hope. And in other years I've been successful. A strawberry crop can last for about five years and then you really need to start over. Okay, and my next one will go about here, and so on down the row. Once I'm finished planting, I'll give them a good drink of water, and then we can add some of the straw that I raked off, or add new straw between the rows and around the plants. This will keep the weeds out of the bed. And hopefully we'll see some nice new strawberry growth as time goes by. Now let's move on into the shade garden in the back. The one nice thing about a cool spring is that it prolongs the bloom of the early spring flowers. These crocuses that you see all over the place have been in bloom now for almost a month and they really have done well this year. I started out with just a few of these little uh, crocus tomasianus, or tommies as they're often called, and they spread. And I love it because they've just filled in all over. And the other thing is they will leave. I won't have to do anything about it. They will just disappear in about another, well, whenever it starts getting warm. So I've got these lovely little purple blooms all over in this area. The helibores have come into full bloom now, and we have lovely little reddish bells. They can be red or pink, or in this case, even green, greenish color. And they will hybridize with one another if you get several varieties, so you can get a variety of shades of color. This one's a little more pink, and they will actually open up even fuller than this as time goes by. Again, these also spread, and I have uh, numerous ones that will be coming up with a few leaves here and there. They even come up into the stone wall. And I can dig some of these up to share with other people or to move around my own garden. So they're a, really a win-win plant. Once the blooms are finished, the show isn't quite over because they put up some beautiful new foliage which will last all season. Uh, it's a good plant, it's easy care, and it really adds a lot to a shade garden. I have other little spring bulbs. This is a Scylla coming up. And but most of these are the uh, little crocuses, which again, once they're finished, you don't even have to think about them. No uh, trimming back, no pulling up. The other thing I have are some dog tooth violets, and they're over here. And these are a native plant. And I found, unfortunately, that the deer do like them too, so I've been spraying them. They'll have yellow pendulant blooms on them in another month, which uh, will add some color to this area. A bleeding heart is starting to come up here, and since this is one of the tall native type bleeding hearts, I will need to put some sort of support here. Probably just a, a tomato support, a small tomato support will hold the branches up so that they don't break off in a wind. Now I'm going to head back towards the pond. A lot of plants are starting to part, poke through in, in this area near the pond. Uh, the pond is still not open as far as having the filtration and pump installed. That can be done anytime I have the time to do it within the next few weeks. I have put a thermometer in to kind of watch the uh, temperature. I don't have any fish right now, hope to get some. We lost our fish to the herons 
year before last, but I do keep track of the temperature. And it's running about 50 degrees, which is a rather normal temperature. That tells me that it's time that I can add some things like muck buster to the uh, pond. Muck defense is what I use. It's an organic enzyme product and it'll help break down some of the leaves that have fallen into the pond over the winter. I also will use a net to remove some of them and uh, clean it out. And lo I'll lower the water level down about two thirds and add new water. And between that and the uh, filtration system that I run, which is a natural one, it should clear up the pond in another month or so, once I've added everything. The enzymes will break down the things and then they can be removed by the filtration. The little plant that you see here is Cyanodoxia, which is usually a short blue plant. This one is called Pink Giant. And it's been a very nice one for me. The deer don't seem to bother it. And it blooms on a longer stalk than the regular blue ones. And they just really are kind of pretty. They seem to have increased in size, which I also like. I also have a uh, trolleyus in this area. And this will come up with some yellow blooms in a few weeks. It's, a, again, one of those that will come up and bloom, and then it dies back. So we can add some annuals back here, perhaps a little later on. I've also planted a few miniature daffodils that will add to the, the show. Other things are coming up in this area. And again, I'm just kind of watching them pulling the leaves away when they start. And they'll be blooming soon, some of the native plants. A number of the spring native plants are, again, what they call spring ephemerals. They'll come up, they'll bloom, and then they're gone. Jack in the pulpits, Dutchman's breeches, things like that. This poor shrub is a mountain laurel, and a tree fell on it. I don't know if it will survive or not. It looks pretty sad right now. But as I pull on some of these stalks, I find that it's rooted. So even if I can't save the whole thing, I think I can save pieces of it. And I may be able to peg down this piece and that means putting maybe a, a piece of wire coat hanger around it, holding it down to the ground and hoping that it will root. It was a lovely round bush that was, had many blooms, but the main stalk was hit by the big branch from the tree, so it is no more. One of the uh, catalogs that I get, and if your name is on the list for a catalog, you will probably get numerous catalogs, is uh, just came, and this is for fall planted bulbs like the Cyanodoxa pink giant. And they were really smart to put it out now because now is when the fall blooming plants are in bloom. So it's a good time to look around your garden while things are blooming. Tulips, daffodils, Cyanodoxa, uh, Scylla, any of the other bulbs that you have, crocuses, and see where the holes are that you'd like to fill this fall. And if you place your order early, you'll probably get a discount. So it's time to look around and see where you want things now. Because if you wait until fall, you'll find that you can't remember where things were. Because they all are gone by then. And you will plant things where there are other things planted instead of in places where you'd like them. So try to make a little plan now for where you want to add the things in the fall. It will really ease it up when all those bulbs come in the mail and you say, oh my, where was I going to plant these? Taking pictures really helps. Uh, and be sure when you do take pictures that you include a, a permanent landmark, a tree, a bench, a statue, a bush that stays all year, something where you can have a, a point of reference when it goes to plant the bulbs. It will really help. This is the lettuce that we planted indoors when it was still snowing outside. Once it germinated, I moved it out here to this uh, cool little sunshed. And it's been growing here fi just fine in spite of the night temperatures that have gone down below freezing. I have also have some broccoli inside, and it too is doing well. Had I left this inside, by now it would be just long and skinny shoots of lettuce, and they would have just been very floppy. They wouldn't be the strong little plants that you see here. These can be 
planted into pots or into the garden probably in another week or so. So it does work. Uh, it was a, something I tried this year not knowing if it was too soon to move them out or not, but it evidently isn't because they're doing well. Now let's head up towards the house. The ever-present weeds coming up in my brick walks all around and this can be a real problem. I've discovered that if I use just vinegar, and this is just white vinegar out of the bottle, into my spray bottle, and if I spray it on a sunny day, it takes care of the weeds coming up between the bricks pretty well. And once they're gone, you can just vacuum them off or blow them off. So I'll just come out maybe once a week and give them a spray. It helps if there's sun. Unfortunately, I feed the birds here, and bird seed tends to grow when it falls on the ground if the birds haven't eaten it. So I have little bird seed plants coming up throughout the bricks in this area. If I can get an early start on these areas, then I won't have a problem the rest of the year. It'll be just an occasional weed which is easily pulled or sprayed with vinegar. But you do need to start early. And it works in all kinds of walks. If you have cracks in a sidewalk, it will help. But again, this is just white vinegar from the grocery store. And it's not as toxic as some of the things you could use. It probably requires a little more frequent application than some of the things you could use that are more toxic. But with the dog and other animals around, I'd really like to keep it less toxic if I can. So I stick with the vinegar and it works pretty well as long as you remember to use it. Let's go in and do some cooking. Coming in from outside uh, in time for dinner and in the spring and summer, when I want to be outside, which is most of the time, I'd much rather be outside. I love to cook, but when it comes to gardening, that takes first choice. So when I want to make something for dinner, I either want to be, have something I can make ahead, like early in the morning, or something that I can put together quickly when I come inside. And I'm going to do one of each today. The first thing I'm going to do is a broccoli salad that can be made ahead. And I'm going to use chopped broccoli. This is a good one to make ahead. Put it in the refrigerator and then take it out in the afternoon or when you're ready to eat. It can also be served for lunch. It's just uh, about five cups of chopped broccoli. And I'm going to add a medium red onion that's been chopped. And again, the quantities on this, you can kind of suit yourself. A half a cup of sunflower seeds. And those are toasted sunflower seeds, unsalted, or you can use salted if you wish, and some bacon, chopped bacon. And again, I've added about four slices which have been cooked. I microwaved it and then cut it up. Uh, the recipe called for up to a whole pound of bacon. I thought that was a little much, uh, but if you really like bacon, you can add a pound of bacon and then that's your whole meal right in the dish. Half a cup of raisins. Seems strange, but they really add a lot to the salad. And then we need to make a little dressing for it. And for that, I'm gonna use one cup of mayonnaise. And I use the Hellman's Light. A third of a cup of sugar. Mix that in. and two tablespoons of vinegar. And I'm going to use the cider vinegar. You could use white vinegar. You could use wine vinegar. Again, this is one where you can vary the ingredients a little bit and still come up with a nice salad. You can also, if you don't want raisins, you could use cranberries, dried cranberries. We've done that and that's pretty good too. And I'll stir in the dressing.
and just coat everything with a bit of it. I'm trying very hard not to spill it all over the counter. Good. Pasta salads are also something you can make ahead and it can be a whole meal if you add tuna or chicken or turkey. And then they're ready. Yeah, they're especially nice on a really hot day. And they can be a whole meal. Or a nice chicken salad. Especially if you have leftover chicken from perhaps a rotisserie chicken or something like that. But there's a salad. And then the next thing I want to make is a turkey pulpitina. And that a pulpitina is a small meatball, and these are lemon and turkey, and I've used a pound of ground turkey, and to that I'll add, I need to kind of see about my ingredients since I put them together yesterday, one and a quarter cups of breadcrumbs, a quarter cup of grated Parmesan cheese, and we'll add the zest of one lemon, I said they were lemon, lemon meatballs, a quarter of a cup of chopped Italian parsley. Hopefully we'll soon have some from the garden. The juice of one lemon, a teaspoon of thyme, dried thyme. If you wanted to use fresh thyme from the garden, oh, not quite ready yet. But you could add three times that, or a tablespoon of fresh thyme would it be the equivalent if you have the fresh. And some salt and pepper. I'm going to add about a half a teaspoon of salt. And a few grinds of pepper. I don't want it too coarse. And I'm going to mix this all together. And one of the best ways to mix this is by hand. And I'm going to put on some gloves because it's messy. These are food safe gloves which are available. Turn this down a little. And we'll mix it around. As you can see, this is the quickest, quickest way to do it. Well, everything's all mixed in. This works for any kind of meatballs. And I'll be forming this into small little meatballs. And I'm going to flatten them down a little bit so they'll cook fast. So they're little, little meat patties. And they'll cook fairly fast, probably about four minutes on each side. I have three tablespoons of butter and two tablespoons of olive oil in the pan, heated up. And again, we'll make these little heat ball patties. Turning the pan because it doesn't seem to be too flat. These have a very light spring flavor with the lemon. They're uh, quite mild in flavor, but they taste to me like something that you would have in the spring with any kind of spring vegetables. 
You're also good with the broccoli. And leftovers aren't bad either. They can be added to a, a pita for a quick lunch with a little lettuce and tomato. Put on pizza. Now this is one batch, we'll do the rest a little later. Now I can take off my gloves. And the first one I put in is probably about ready to be turned. As I slowly go around the pan, as you can see they're nice and brown on one side. Once you've turned them, this would probably be a good time to set the table, and you're going to be ready to eat very soon. A little on food safety, ground meat should be cooked. Any ground meat, whether it's turkey, chicken, beef, or pork, should be cooked to 165 degrees. And I will use my little thermometer here to check that out. Make sure it's on Fahrenheit. Most, most of these instant reads have several different settings, and we are not near it yet. But we will get there. So we'll give it a little longer. And it's the last one you put in that you want at 165. That ensures that they all will be, pretty much. We've achieved our 165 degree temperature in one of the larger pieces. So now it's time we can serve them up. And what I'm going to do is serve them on a bed of just egg noodles that I have cooked. And you could be doing that while these were cooking, which again is a very short time. Also serve them with potatoes, mashed potatoes would be good, or even uh, canned cannellini beans for an Italian meal. So we have a quick meal. spring bouquet to go with our dinner. We'll set the table and be ready for a quick meal after a day in the garden. And there we have our quick, quick meal after a long day in the garden. I'm Liz Davey and you've been watching a walk in the garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television. I would like to remind you that the display Books in Bloom will be available in the library with floral arrangements by the Garden Club of Norfolk and books, of course, by the library until Saturday, April 14th, 2 o'clock.
please try to visit if you have a chance. Mm -hmm.